on 7.9 FM, this is GTFM on a Friday afternoon, uh, coming up to 10 minutes after 12 o'clock. Welcome to the show. Uh, as I've been mentioning all morning, my very special guest this afternoon is MP for the Rhondda Valley. He's in the studio now. Good afternoon, Chris Bryan. Good afternoon, Chris. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah. So I didn't know this until I did my research. It is important, of course, to do some research. Um, born in Cardiff. Uh, no, I know lots, lots of people think I'm English just because I sort of sound English. But I was born in Cardiff. My brother's called Rodri. My father's called Rhys. The gates of the Arms Park are named after my great grand uncle and all that kind of stuff. But we went to live in Spain when I was seven. Dad got a job in Spain, so we were there for five years. And, and now I speak with an accent which sounds very sort of um, English. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your Spanish like? Because you can speak Spanish quite fluently. Sí, hablo castellano bastante bien. De jovencito vivíamos en España, por eso sí hablo castellano. <laughs> That's going to be a first for GTFM. Anyway, um, welcome. Um, now, you studied theology back in the day. Was there anything that drew you to that career initially? Uh, yes, I mean, in, in essence, I remember my mother sitting on my bed when I, on my 13th birthday and telling me that she drank too much. And um, the next few years were pretty miserable at home. And mum got into a worse and worse state with booze. And my parents split up. And in my last year at school, um, I, uh, I ended up uh, living with a very lovely couple. He was a, a priest in the Church of England. And... Um, Mark, Sam and Margaret Salter and uh, and then when I went to university at Oxford I went to church and a lot of the people who looked after me and supported me were um, uh, part of the church and that meant that I wanted I decided that I wanted to be ordained I wanted to be a vicar and I spent six years as a vicar excellent and then politics of course uh, winning the general election in 2001 and of course you, you've written books as well Stafford Cripps a leading politician in the early part of the 20th century and Glenda Jackson Yes, and I knew Glenda because um, she was an MP at the same time as me, but I, I wrote this before I became an MP. Uh, I'd helped on her election and campaign when she was first elected in 1992. Uh, and, of course, I'd seen her in everything, you know, I mean, Women in Love. Uh, um, I, I, and it was great writing the book because I got to go and meet lots of the actors that she'd worked with in Hollywood. Um, you know, Walter Matthau and people like that, who were absolutely fascinating. So That must have been a great thrill. Yes, it was. I was meant to be with Walter, Walter Matthau for five minutes, his publicist said, but I was there for three and a half hours, and he showed me all his, um, all his old kind of paperwork and so on, including his, his scrawly signature, which he'd done um, on the Stockholm Peace Pledge, which was, in the McCarthy era, was, which was what proved that you were a communist. Um, but he said he deliberately signed it, illegibly so but nobody knew it was him so he didn't get into trouble <laughs> oh, absolutely now you worked uh, very closely with harriet harman lovely lady and um, a strong figure in the house of commons uh, yes i was uh, um i was Har harriet sort of bag carrier for a while and then i was and i helped her write some gags um sometimes she delivered them well uh, <laughs> she, she would she, i think she would admit if she were here now that selling gags is not her favorite thing she sometimes still texts and asks for more gags. Um, but uh, And then I was her deputy when she was leader of the House, and um, we brought quite a few changes into the way Parliament does its business. Um, and then I was Europe Minister under Gordon Brown. Absolutely. Now then, you've served under Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Ed Miliband. Now, with Ed, a lot of people thought that maybe it should have been David that might have become the leader then. Any, any views on that? Uh, I, I voted for David. I, David was my boss when I was Europe Minister. He was the Foreign Secretary, and he were, I couldn't want for a better leader. He, I, I thought he was, he was really an uh, impressive figure, and I think probably things might have worked out differently if, if he'd become leader. I think maybe yeah. the Labour Party would be in a different place today. Do you think he might come back one day? I think it's very difficult to come back if you've gone off to the United States of America because you can't just presume that somebody there's going to be a seat in Parliament for you, can you? No. Uh, so, no, I don't think he's going to come back. And anyway, I think we need to look to the future rather than look to the past all the time. And talking to the future, of course, Jeremy Corbyn. A um, bit of a surprise initially, but you've, you've settled into that uh, role as leader of the opposition. Yeah, he's done it a few um, years now, obviously, and um, I didn't vote for Jeremy. Uh, I had a big falling out with him about Europe in particular because I... I'm a passionate pro-European. I believe that um, I'm an internationalist. I'm a socialist. I believe that the best way to achieve for um, prosperity for Britain is to be part of a strong uh, trading partnership in Europe. And I, you know, I'm. I think Jeremy th sees that slightly differently, and that upsets me. But more importantly, um, I just think at the moment the country's 
going to hell in a handcart is what it feels like and the politicians can't sit down and work out a common cause together and I really worry for our future. Yeah, Brexit now two and a half years. It's, it's, it dominates the news every single day. People do get frustrated. Um, do, do you think this current deal is going to get voted in? I'm not going to vote for it, and I can't. I don't think any. I don't think a single Labour MP will vote for it because I don't think it protects workers' rights, and 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 a large part of it is just a wish list. Frankly, I mean, it's it's about as much use as a as a letter to Santa Claus, and much less chance of being delivered on. To be honest, so uh, I don't think any Labour MPs will. I know a lot of Tories aren't going to vote for it as well. But what really upsets me is what Theresa May should have done after she had her general election last year and she lost her majority. She should have said, "All right, folks." Um, all the people of goodwill who want to sit around a table and put together a, a, a good deal that is in the interest of the whole country, whether you're Labour or Tory, I don't care, that's what I'm going to try and build that kind of government. She didn't. She decided that the only thing that mattered to her was to try to keep the Tories in power and keep the Tories together. And I think it means that she's been chasing the tail of you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg and David Davis and Boris Johnson and people like that. And I think that in the end will do terrible harm to places like the Ronda. Yes, and uh, we leave next March, probably with no deal? Well, I, I, I'm not convinced we will be leaving next March. For a start, um, if there's going to be no deal, then the law simply will not be in a good enough position. I mean, th there's real danger that we won't have... I don't want to do all this kind of doom-mongering, because I think that's exaggerated sometimes, but you do have to have a sensible strategy. So, for instance, I don't think we've got enough border police to be able to control the border at that point. Um, so I think we'll have to have a postponement of at least three or four months. Now, it's been an interesting time since you've been uh, MP for the Ronda. We've had phone hacking, of course. We've had the Iraqi war, uh, MPs' expenses. It's all been done and dusted. But interesting times and stressful as well on occasions, I would have thought, Chris. Uh, yes, I keep a diary um, and have done ever since I was elected. So I, and sometimes I dip, dip back to remember because you forget the sequence that yeah. things happen. And, um, that probably was in the right order there, but it was probably the Iraqi war first. <laughs> no, no, well, I wasn't having a go at you. I mean, it's just that I forget sometimes. You, you know, you think, oh, I met such and such like two years ago, and it turns out it was 14 years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, well, I was very closely involved in the phone hacking. Uh, the, you know, Rupert Murdoch's company hacked my phone. They denied it for years, and then they ended up having to pay me some money. And I remember everybody telling me, because I, I, my legal costs were £480,000, Fortunately, because I'd won, Murdoch had to pay that as well. But I was really nervous that I was going to lose my home and, and all the rest of it, and so was my partner. Um, but uh, well, so we got a bit of a payout, and everybody said oh, I should give it to charity. And I said, excuse my language, but I said, bugger that for a game of soldiers. I'm afraid <laughs> I'm having a new bathroom. So we now have a new bathroom in Porth, and we call it the Rupert Room. And every time I use it, I think of him. Yeah, I bet you do. Now, we're talking to your partner, Jared. Of course, you were the first uh, couple to have uh, a civil ceremony in the Palace of Westminster. That was a proud moment for you. We were. We had to get the law changed. Gordon Brown was really helpful because the, the law, the, there was a chapel in Parliament, which um, straight couples have been able to use if you're an MP or, or the son or daughter of an MP for years and years and years for centuries, um, but we weren't, that's not open to us because the church doesn't do um, civil partnerships. Um, so we had to get the whole of the Palace of Westminster registered for civil weddings and civil partnerships. So, and then we were the first couple, but the good thing is now anybody can get married there if they want to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, any plans to get married? Because of course that's recently changed as well. Well, uh, um, as long as Jared doesn't listen to this, I have asked him several times, but he says no. Because we have a civil partnership, we had a, I mean, the only reason we would do it is to have another party, really, and the last party was quite expensive, so I, <laughs> I, I can't see that we are going to. We, oddly enough, Scylla Black uh, invited herself to our civil partnership. Um, surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> yeah. Lovely lady, sadly missed, of course, Chris. Uh, no, yeah. you had cross-party support. This is a wonderful achievement, I think, to increase the sentencing uh, for people who attack members of the civil service, uh, sorry, the, the emergency services. Now, it seems incredible. Uh, what motivated you, you know, apart from the obvious thing, to get the sentences increased? Well, the strange thing is, we, we have a system in Parliament, if you, most MPs don't get to write their own law, and you only get to do it if you do it, if you come top of a ballot, and I did last year. Um, and so I, I came up with six ideas of changes to the law that I would like, that all of which I'd be happy to do, and I did a ballot online, 
Um, 40,000 people took part and the Ronda voted for this to come top, which was a new law um, introducing a new offence of attacking an emergency worker. There'd always been a law about attacking a police officer, but it was very old and wasn't used very much. So this new law means all emergency workers, so you know, ambulance workers, uh, doctors in hospital, um, fire officers, um, police officers and prison officers. Um, and that came into force uh, 14 days ago. And last week, the first person was sentenced under it, uh, and he got 15 months for um, uh, a sexual assault on an, uh, uh, an ambulance worker. I mean, it was, I think it was a relatively minor sexual assault, but um, but I'm really step in the right and, direction. Yeah, exactly. And the judge said um, a year ago, I wouldn't have been able to give this sentence, and now I can. So that is, a, I'm I'm really pleased because the the tide, the rising tide of attacks on uh, emergency workers has been extraordinary. I was in. Um, the Royal Glamorgan about four months ago and talking to the people working in the mental health unit there and they were saying quite often and recently they've had attacks on their staff on mental health nurses and then the police refuse to do anything about it because they say well you know you've got to put up with a bit of violence in your line of work and I think that's completely wrong mm -hmm. so there's a real challenge for the police oddly enough now um, and I, it, does, it, it really angers me that we have so many fewer police than we had, you know, eight years ago. Twenty thousand fewer police in the UK. Um, I think it makes that's it much a more, lot, isn't it? It's a lot. It makes it much more difficult for them to do their job. Mm. Would you like to see that extended to maybe people like conductors on the trains, for example, who, who are there through work? Uh, maybe bus drivers and people like that. Would you like to see an extension to that? Well, we discussed that. So the original version of the bill wasn't going to include nurses and um, you know everybody else working in the NHS. And there was a discussion about um, whether we should extend it to teachers and so on. I think if you if you make it too general, then you're not dealing with a specific really big problem that you've got at the moment. Um, so. I'm reluctant to change it now. I think let's see how this goes for the next two or three years. Let's make sure that the police actually enforce it and the courts enforce it. Um, at, because you know, if you don't have the police and the emergency services able to do their job, then they're not able to save people's lives. I mean, I mean it, the bit that, in the, in, that I first saw this in the Ronda was um, the fire brigade had turned up to a fire on, on the mountains, which the kids had set fire to, and you know, you you bash your head against the wall wondering why kids want to do that in the first place but it was really endangering people's houses and then when the fire brigade turned up kids started throwing stones at them and bricks and you go you know what's wrong with you what's wrong in your head mm, absolutely i mentioned trains i've got a question that's coming through on an email uh, from matt in pontypree from the greg uh, good afternoon to you matt uh, what's going to be done with regards to transport for wales the number of trains that are out of service and the service that's currently being provided, paying for a seat but instead cramped circumstances each day from Pontypridd to Cardiff. It's been shocking the last few weeks in particular and the number of times it's a two seat, a two carriage train instead of a four carriage train doing the Treherbert line, I mean it's been appalling and I've, I have written to them. Um, you know there is a whole new suite of trains coming on board, online in the next few years but the truth is that we haven't invested enough in the past. The trains are I think the official term is knackered um, and consequently quite often a lot of them simply aren't, aren't able to run but we, we, we have to do better. Now I hope that within the next two years we will have on the Treherbert line and therefore from Ponty as well both um, four trains an hour instead of just two so if the first one is full then you can get on one 15 minutes later but secondly um, all the trains will be four carriage there'll be newer trains with proper toilets proper disabled access and uh, I think importantly, some of them will stop all the way down to Ponty and then go swiftly down to Cardiff, mm. um, so that you know we can improve on the time uh, the time it takes. Because you know this is about people's livelihoods. Thanks very much for the question, Matt. Uh, now then, your opinions. I'm going to mention three presidents: Donald Trump, Emmanuel Macron, and President Putin. Any thoughts on those three? Uh, so I think Putin is a murdering uh, thief. Uh, who has left his own people poorer um, than they were 15 years ago. Uh, I, he, uh, I know Marina Litvinenko quite well, and, and he uh, murdered her husband, for instance. Uh, lots of journalists in his country are being killed. Uh, I think he's a danger to the West, and we need to be very careful. Um, uh, Emmanuel Macron. Um, <laughs> Macron. Uh, I, I quite like a lot of the things he says and does, um, but I think he's he's not great on 
uh, trade unions and um, but France does need to modernize uh, the one I can't abide is Donald Trump who I think is a lying toe rag absolutely there we are I think that sums it all up <laughs> <laughs> well and, is, and, and what message does it send to girls in particular the yes. way he treats women yes. um, and and the lies he tells just barefaced lies mm, unbelievable big fan of Twitter yes uh, but it, it just mystified I, I mean I know somebody explained to me why he does the lies it's because if you own up to having done something naughty 100% of people believe that you've done something naughty but if you just lie 40% will probably believe you mm -hmm. and but that cynicism I, th I just think it, it brings the whole of politics into disrepute and it really really angers me do you think he'd be there for the, the, the second term oh, I hope not mm -hmm. you know I mean the thing is sometimes we all this is the thing I've learned we all moan and then we lots of us be don't careful bother. what you wish for well then lots of people don't bother to vote mm -hmm. and then well you can't moan anymore if you haven't even bothered to vote now you've championed community radio, thank you very much indeed for that, because we are a charity at the end of the day, GTFM. We'd like to see Ofcom to extend, extend that a little bit right across the valleys. Yes, I mean, you know, the thing is, we tend to end up with a lot of our media in the, in the valleys, in, in particular in the Ronde. It all gets written about in Cardiff uh, or in London or in the big cities, you know, and sometimes it's difficult to get a, a kind of proper local voice. And I think that that's, that's why that's really important. In the you know, and the local newspapers are dying as well, aren't they? Mm, yeah. I remember the Ronda Leader used to have like forty thousand copies sold a week, and now it's more like four thousand. Mm, sad, very, very sad. Now, what about your own ambitions, then, Chris? Hopefully, uh, in your in your mind, a, a Labour government uh, after the next election. Um, ambitions: Prime Minister, Chancellor, Home Secretary, I've Foreign never, Secretary. I've never wanted to be. I wouldn't mind being Foreign Secretary, but I've never, I've never wanted to be Prime Minister. I've, I, I've, I've. Never, I think about two people once asked me whether I'd stand for leader of the Labour Party um, and, um, uh, and I, I've never wanted to do that. Uh, I, I do enjoy the job I'm doing at the moment. One of the strange things about being in opposition is there's only so much you can achieve. You can do far more if you're in government, of course. But I know that I'm going to be in, you know, I don't think there'll be a general election until 2022. So mm -hmm. what I've been trying to do at the moment is, is do things where I can make a real difference. So. Um, we created the Ronda Arts Festival in Chalky last this last year for the first time. Raft, we've just been putting together the programme for next year. I hope that will grow and grow and grow so that in a few years' time people will be saying, oh, when's the Ronda Fest Arts Festival coming up, just like they do about hay. Um, and uh, I've done my bill about emergency workers, but the other thing I've been fighting a lot on is brain injury because a shocking statistic is that every class, every primary school class in this country will have four kids who've had a brain injury in it. Mm -hmm. And that affects their whole development, their whole education for the rest of their lives. And do you li liaison, Chris, with people like Anne Cloyd, Wayne David, Owen Smith, uh, uh, Nick Smith, Gerald Jones, you know, your fellow Valley MPs, do you, do you get together? Yeah, yeah, no, we do a lot. And uh, uh, Owen's office in Parliament is like two doors away from mine. Okay. Um, Anne and I are both on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and uh, yeah, no, we work a lot together. We have um, it's like every ten days we have a meeting of all the Welsh Labour MPs. Uh, we don't push the North Wales MPs off to the side. <laughs> we we try to work all together as a team because I think that you know in the end, I, as I said earlier, I'm a socialist. I believe that you can achieve far more by your common endeavour than you do just on your own. And uh, are you enjoying the job? Um, to be honest, it's 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 weird. A year ago, I was quite fed up and a bit depressed with it all because I thought there's not much one can achieve but actually um, there's lots of things we've managed to get done in this last year one of the things I've been campaigning for for years and years and years was that the overseas territories that are British like the Cayman Islands and so on which have oper operated as tax havens and um, I've always wanted them to have proper open transparent systems so we put to you know that tax haven thing in the past so the people pay their fair fair share of tax in particular the very wealthy and we managed that this year mm. we managed that this year so you know i mean that, that sense of when you achieve something is great um the whole brexit thing it, it you do feel as if you put your head in the microwave um but in the end it's going to be the biggest decision that we will make as a country since the second world war and we need to get it right i'm i spent oddly in the last few weeks, I've probably spent as much time talking to Tories as to Labour MPs and to Lib Dems and Greens and SNP and to Plaid and so on, because I think a lot of us share a view that um, 
you know, that what we were offered as Brexit in 2016 was based on a complete and utter pack of lies, and it's now time that people had a chance to vote again. And do you think we'll get that second referendum? I think so. Um, it, 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 I think the, the movement in favour of it grows every day because, you know, loads of people who voted leave in, in the Rondas have said to me, um, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Mm. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't. I thought there was going to be more money for the, the Welsh budget, but there, there seems to be less money for the Welsh budget, and there's still cuts in local um, budgets and stuff. Uh, and and nobody voted to be poorer. Nobody um, voted for this version of Brexit. And to re I, I've all the emails I've had. I've not had a single email saying vote for Theresa May's deal. Mm, not right. a single one from the Ronda. That sums it all up. Chris, thanks very much for coming in to have a chat with us today. Thank you. You're very welcome to come My back usual fee, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My usual fee being <laughs> the sum total of naught. <laughs> GTFM is a charity, sir. <laughs> yes, and I'm not. <laughs> I know, but, but, but really, you, no, no, you're I'm welcome. Joking, I'm yeah, joking. I know that, of course you are. And uh, you're welcome to come back anytime you want to. Oh, and, uh, you know, if there is a second random, you come back and have a chat with us well, at I've any got, other time. I've got my surgery later on this afternoon, so maybe there'll be some people then to talk to me about that. <laughs> I'm sure there will be. Chris Bryant, MP for the Ronda, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Okie doke, cheers.